Today we continue with the brain infections and this is another important chapter that is a brain abscess. So what is a brain abscess? Brain abscess is basically a focal or localized suppurative infection within the brain parenchyma which ultimately will be surrounded by a capsule which is highly vascularized. And if the brain abscess is not encapsulated then we call it cerebritis. So these two pathologies go side by side. The common organisms that you find in a brain abscess or cerebritis in a immunocompetent host, one is your streptococci accounting for about 40%. They might be anaerobics, aerobic and also streptococcus viridens. Then enterococci like proteas and klebsiella, various anaerobic infections and staphylococcus. So this is the approximate pattern of organism that causes brain abscess in a immunocompetent individual. And in immunocompromised individuals, there are other organisms like nocardia, toxoplasma, aspergillus and candida. In the tropical countries including India, tuberculosis is a very common cause of brain abscess. And in Central and South America, neurocysticercosis is another very common cause of a brain abscess. How does the brain get the infection? It can get the infection by direct spread from adjoining structures like mastoiditis or uh, chronic suppurative otitis media by way of a head injury, either a surgery to the brain, neurosurgical or a direct head trauma, open head trauma and the thirdly it is by blood bone. Bacteremia in the blood leading to localization of the organisms also in the brain tissue. So these are the three different modes of spread of the disease. What are the pathological changes? The pathological changes passes through several phases. The first is the early cerebritis when there will be a diffuse inflammation of a focal area of the brain without any abscess formation. Then in the later stages of the cerebritis, which we call it a late cerebritis, there will be central pus formation within the cerebritis. After that, the peripheral area which has now organized will form a vascular capsule. And this is the early capsular phase. And then there will be a late capsular phase where there will be a vascularized capsule. The infection will recede, the pus formation will recede. and the central area which had the pus will go for gliosis that is breakdown and lysis which ultimately heals by a scar and this scar remains as a epileptogenic focus to develop epilepsies later on. So if you consider the causes of epilepsy you will find that brain abscess after it has healed or even during the process of the brain abscess there might be a focal epilepsy starting from that point. So these are the different forms of pathologies of a brain abscess. The clinical features depends upon several factors. One is where the abscess is located in which part of the brain. Then the nature of the infection whether it is one of the acute pyogenic organisms or whether it is tubercular or whether it is fungal. The underlying comorbid status of the individual whether he is immunocompromised or immunocompetent. Then the degree of increased pressure within the brain, raised intracranial pressure as a result of cerebral edema. So these are the basic underlying factors which will give rise to the clinical features. So fever which is almost 100% common in a patient with meningitis or encephalitis will be found in less than 50% of people with a brain abscess. So a brain abscess, you don't expect that the patient will come to you with fever. Any of the features of a raised intracranial tension, focal neurological deficit or a seizure, any of these features, one has to suspect brain abscess as one of the underlying pathologies. So headache, fever and a focal neurological deficit which we would expect are found in less than 50% of these cases. So these are the patterns of the clinical features that you may encounter in a patient with brain abscess. So how do we diagnose? Once you get a patient with altered behavior, features of raised intracranial tension, there may be fever, there may not be fever, focal deficits 
like a monoplasia or a hemiplasia, altered sensorium in part of the body, visual abnormalities, cognitive disorders, hearing abnormalities, any of these focal neurological deficits, headache, fever, may be present, may not be present, you have to consider a brain abscess in the differential diagnosis. And you confirm by doing a MRI or a CT scan. CT scan is a quicker mode. MRI is time consuming and costlier, but this is a better form of investigation. Once you find that there is a localized organized area within the brain, it can be many other issues other than a brain abscess. So what you do is you go for a CT guided needle aspiration and go for culture sensitivity and once the culture sensitivity report arrives, you go for specific antibiotic treatment. Now what are the differential diagnoses? Differential diagnoses are basically due to a space occupying lesion or it can be due to infection in the brain. Any of these two things can mimic a brain abscess or a brain abscess can mimic either of these two or infection within the head or associated raised intracranial tension with focal neurological deficit. So a subdural empyema, an empyema which is localized in between the pia arachnoid and the dura. So it is basically outside the brain and it is compressing upon some area of the brain. This is subdural empyema. Any form of meningitis, especially the chronic meningitis like tubercular. Viral encephalitis, including Japanese B encephalitis, where you may find fever, altered sensorium, focal neurological deficit, seizures, neck rigidity, and, and other focal signs like an extensor plantar response. Then superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So that also would lead to production of features of a mask lesion. Then acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. This is an explosive form of viral encephalitis which you find, find in some forms of viral meningitis or encephalitis. So that also may mimic a brain abscess and intracranial space occupying lesion. That means a brain tumor. If the temperature is elevated, you don't consider the differential diagnosis of a brain tumor. But if there is no temperature elevation, there is mood changes, localized focal deficits, headache, lack of concentration, seizures, focal. So then you consider the possibility of a intracranial abscess and this will come in the basic differential diagnosis and one has to differentiate these from a brain abscess. Treatment. The treatment of choice is antibiotics to be given parenterally, drainage of the abscess that is the second part and thirdly prophylactic anticonvulsants. Even if the person does not have seizures, you will have to give anticonvulsants because the person are prone to develop seizures with a brain abscess. The choice of the antibiotics will depend upon where the infection has been contacted. If it is community acquired, that is a blood-borne type of brain abscess, a cephalosporin with metronidazole is sufficient. If it is due to a head trauma, you have to upscale the antibiotics septazidim, a fourth generation cephalosporin along with vancomycin for a prolonged period of six to eight weeks or merapenem and vancomycin for a same duration of time. If there are features of raised intracranial tension like headache, vomiting, bradycardia, lack of concentration, papilledema, if any of the features of raised intracranial tension are present, you may have to add in corticosteroid. Usually we add dexamethasone about 4 to 8 milligram, 2 to 3 times a day for about 7 to 10 days. So that is the corticosteroid that you have to add to reduce the cerebral edema. So that takes up with your brain, brain abscess. Now based on the etiological source of the organism and the site, what is the treatment plan in more details? It can be, the abscess can be in the frontal lobe, it can be in the temporal lobe, it may be in the cerebellum. If it is due to a penetrating injury, it may be anywhere or there might be multiple or metastatic brain abscesses in many areas of the brain. So if it is a frontal lobe abscess, the source of infection are usually from the paranasal sinuses or from the teeth, usually the teeth of the maxillary teeth. Temporal digestant 
infective site is the middle ear that is a csom or chronic suppurative otitis media if cerebellum is the source of the brain abscess then the site of infection which has come in is usually from the sphenoidal sinus or from the mastoid or from the middle ear and if it is a penetrating injury the abscess can occur anywhere depending upon where the injury has occurred and in case of metastatic blood borne multiple site brain abscess it can be at any part of the brain the organisms we have already elaborated it can be streptococci it can be anaerobes it can be some enterobacteriaceae it can be gram negative like seromonas it can be staphylococcus also so any of these infections may occur and depending upon the type of infections your cefotaxim and metronidazole is a combination if it is enterobacteriaceae with streptococci then ampicillin and metronidazole then if it is your pseudomonas and anaerobes if it is ceftazidim plus zentamicin or vancomycin staphylococcus we go for flu proxacillin which is also sensitive for staphylococcus and cefotaxim and if it is streptococci and anaerobes we may have to go for if it is a blood borne basically benzyl penicillin or if it is not available or if the person is sensitive then cefotaxim and metronidazole so this is a usual pattern that you have to give and the duration of treatment is 4 to 8 weeks which is prolonged so that finishes our brain abscess so keeping the slide open let us go to what are the features of a brain tumor in contrast to your a tumor in other parts of the body we consider any space occupying lesion to have to be considered seriously as a tumor in case of the tumor occurring inside the cerebral vault in case of lung in case of a liver or in case of any other part of the body we try to differentiate them into a benign tumor and a malignant tumor because of the rapidity of the growth metastasis and poor prognosis of a metastatic tumor in contrast to a benign tumor but in case of the brain or in case of the head because the area is fixed it cannot expand any rapidly growing mass inside the brain is considered as a brain tumor irrespective of being a, a malignant or a benign even benign if it occurs in a vital area is may be fatal now what are the features of a brain tumor brain tumor basically produces some features due to raised intracranial tension some of the features because of its local affection in a particular area of the central nervous system that is the brain and third is its inherent characteristics producing the or the tumor characteristics so these are the three features that you have in a brain tumor what are the features of a raised intracranial tension the features of raised intracranial tension are headache usually a central headache diffuse the person will not be able to localize the headache and it is not a very severe headache it will be extended headache it will go on for some time lack of concentration altered behavior sometimes even depression and dementia may be suspected in these patients then if you examine this patient they will have systolic hypertension bradycardia together with that a papilla edema in the eyes if you do a fundoscopy and focal neurological deficit depending upon in which area of the brain the tumor is located if it is in the frontal lobe there would be features of disorientation loss of consciousness temporal lobe hearing occipital lobe with vision in the precentral gyrus motor postcentral gyrus sensory and so on depending upon the site where the tumor has been located together with that a cortical tumor may be associated with a focal epilepsy or a focal epilepsy with secondary generalization so these are the features that you find in a patient coming with a brain tumor so brain tumor comes as a differential diagnosis of basically your headache any patient coming with an headache you have to consider it as a possibility that uh, it might be a brain tumor as well so with this we wrap up 
the raised intracranial tension and brain abscess, we are left out with only one infection that is a viral encephalitis. Now just give you a hint of viral encephalitis, there are different viruses producing encephalitis. Herpes simplex is the most common found in the western hemisphere. In India, herpes simplex infection producing encephalitis is very uncommon. The most common organism producing encephalitis, viral encephalitis in India, that too in eastern India or northeast of this country is Japanese bee encephalitis. This is a very common organism in most parts of the northeast. You will find this as an epidemic coming every year in the rainy season months because the, it is an arthropod bone disease transmitted by the Culex mosquito and the host is, the definitive host is the pig and the human beings are intermediate host. If a Culex mosquito bites a pig and then bites a human being, then the disease is transmitted to the human being. Human beings are the closed ended host, human to human transmission even of, of which a mosquito bite is, will never occur. So if a person has got viral encephalitis in a ward, and there are mosquitoes, if they keep on biting one individual to another, the disease will not be transmitted from one individual to the other, but it has to go through the definitive host of the pig. So that is an important part of the epidemiology of the disease. How do they present? They present with severe headache, usually frontal, high fever, along with global loss of consciousness or orientation. These three things are, two of these are almost invariable. Together with that, after a couple of days, there might be focal neurological deficits, including a monoplasia or a hemiplasia, and focal abnormal movements, fasciculations, or seizures, focal seizures. These are the classical features. If you get a, a sporadic case of viral encephalitis, the diagnosis requires paired testing of the antibody in the blood or in the CSF that is a rising titer. But if you are getting them as an epidemic in a society, this is no longer required because if they will come one after another and your diagnosis is more or less empirical. So you don't need to diagnose each and every case once you know that in this particular locality the disease has already started. Now how will you confirm the diagnosis? Clinically, these features of encephalitis, that means the neck stiffness will be there, loss of orientation, consciousness, plantars will be extensor. If you do a lumbar puncture, you will find that the fluid pressure is raised. Together with that, there will be features of, CSF features are similar to viral meningitis. That means there will be raised pressure, mild elevation of the protein, maybe up to about 60 to 80 milligram cells will go up to about 100 or 120 lymphocytes. Protein cells, sugar will be normal. Sugar will not be elevated or de reduced. Sugar will be normal and it will be bacteriologically sterile. If you do a titer of the antibody for Japanese B encephalitis, it will be positive. And if you do it in the convalescent phase also, it will be rising. So this is how you diagnose. Treatment is symptomatic. Paracetamol, fluids, caring of the person who is unconscious, anti-epileptic drugs for seizures and sometimes you may consider giving dexamethasone to for the raised intracranial pressure. So this is how you treat. The most important differential diagnosis of Japanese B encephalitis or your viral encephalitis is cerebral malaria. So these two diseases occur in the same geographical area. Both of them are transmitted by mosquitoes. One is transmitted by the Culex. Cerebral malaria is transmitted by female Anopheles mosquito. Both of them present with fever, altered sensorium. So the differential diagnosis is very important. Cerebral malaria is treatable with antimalarial drugs. For viral encephalitis, we don't have any specific treatment. So the differential diagnosis is very important. You have to make a differential diagnosis between these two. Cerebral malaria patients epidemiologically come as sporadic patients. Japanese B encephalitis patients come in bunches. Lot of them will come from the same area. That is one point. The CSF in cerebral malaria except for mild elevation of the pressure is absolutely normal. 
you will find some changes in the CSF in case of encephalitis. So these are the two things. Other than that, practically it is very difficult to differentiate between these two. In cerebral malaria, you have to treat with specific antimalarials. You will not give mannitol or dexamethasone. Whereas dexamethasone is sometimes empirically given in viral encephalitis. So this is the main differentiation between these two. Cerebral malaria may be associated with hypoglycemia. This disease usually is not associated with hypoglycemia unless the person has not been fed properly. But in cerebral malaria, the organism itself can consume a lot of glucose in the body producing hypoglycemia. So these are the main differences between these two particular diseases. We will progress now to another chapter that is the... So we have finished with the entire cerebral infections starting from meningitis to encephalitis to brain abscess its differential diagnosis as well as how to differentiate from cerebral malaria now we go to the peripheral nervous system i will start with the peripheral nervous system and if time permits we will proceed a little bit and then continue in the next class and finish it up so the first thing that you have to differentiate is peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system any part of the nervous system which lies within the pyarachnoid system is called the central nervous system and anything outside the pyarachnoid system is the peripheral nervous system. So it is not that any nervous tissue inside the cranium vault or in the, within the spinal canal is central nervous system and anything outside is a peripheral nervous system. That is no. Even some of the cranial nerves which remain within the cranial vault, within the cranium, are parts of the peripheral nervous system. So you have to think and understand these two concepts. The peripheral nervous system has got basically very roughly three components. One is a motor component, one is a sensory component and other is a autonomic component. The peripheral nervous system again can be the roots of the spinal cords, sensory or motor, or the fibers coming from the autonomic neurons, these are also peripheral, sympathetic and parasympathetic, or they may join with each other to form different nerves. They are also part of the peripheral nervous system. A median nerve, a femoral nerve, these are all peripheral nerves. But the cervical eight root, is a root segment. It can be an anterior root, which is motor. It can be a posterior root, which is sensory. If they join together and come out along with joining with other roots, that forms a nerve, either a median nerve or an ulnar nerve. Median nerve and ulnar nerve or the femoral nerve are mixed nerves. They have got both sensory and motor components. And some of the nerves will also have autonomic components. But their origin is are different. The motor origin is different, sensory origin is different, or autonomic origins are different, but they come out as different nerves. Now, peripheral neuropathy, earlier we used to call them peripheral neuritis because the component of inflammation was thought to be there, but nowadays we know that inflammation does not occur in all of these abnormalities of the peripheral nerve, so we call them peripheral neuropathy. Any disorder of the peripheral nerves starting from the roots up to the distal ends, either motor, sensory, autonomic or mixed are peripheral neuropathies. These neuropathies may be pure motor neuropathies, they may be pure sensory neuropathies, they may be pure autonomic neuropathies, they may be mixed. They may occur symmetrically both in upper limbs and lower limbs when we call them peripheral neuritis or peripheral neuropathy. They may occur in a single nerve when we call it a mononeuropathy. When they occur in many single nerves, we call it a mononeuropathy multiplex, which may be totally having a asymmetric pattern. So peripheral neuropathies may be pure motor, peripheral neuropathies may be pure sensory, peripheral neuropathies may be pure autonomy, peripheral neuropathies may be mixed, peripheral neuropathy may be proximal, peripheral neuropathy may be distal, it may be pure motor, pure sensory, autonomic, distal, proximal and it can also be a symmetric peripheral neuropathy or asymmetric 
when it is asymmetric it may be a mononeuropathy like one facial nerve palsy one sixth nerve palsy or one ulnar nerve palsy or it can be multiple small small nerves or different nerves we call it mononeuropathy multiplex multiple single nerves but not peripheral neuropathy in a generic term because if it is peripheral neuropathy it will come from distal to proximal so that is with this introduction let us go a little bit into the introductory part of peripheral neuropathy this is a little difficult chapter for you you try to understand the concepts as much as we can teach you in a digital class if you come on for your your day to face to face lecture classes maybe within this month it would be more easy to tell you these things we can ask you we can have an eye contact with you otherwise just looking into the tv camera it becomes very difficult for me whether you can understand whether you are sleeping whether you are just not listening at all i would not know so with that background i am just repeating what i have written down peripheral nerves may be sensory may be motor may be autonomic disease can affect the neurons it can affect the peripheral nerve processes and the nerve process process has got two parts inside we have the axon it is surrounded by a myelin sheet if it is a myelin sheet which is affected we call it myelitis demyelination if it is axon we call it axonolysis most peripheral nerves are mixed as i told you and they contain sensory motor and some autonomic fibers the nerves can be subdivided into three major groups or basically the nerve fibers can be subdivided into three major classes some are the large myelinated fibers some are the sm smaller fibers which may be either myelinated or non myelinated i don't have a blackboard to show you what it is a um, large myelinated fiber means the diameter of the axon is big and it is encased within a myelin sheet smaller fibers the diameter of the axon is smaller it may be an encased within a myelin sheet or it may not be when we say that it is unmyelinated now most of the motor axons are the large myelinated fibers and the larger the fiber and if they have a myelin sheet the nerve impulse propagation is faster so motor fibers can propagate the impulses much faster sensory fibers may be of three types there may be large diameter sensory fiber which conducts the proprioceptive and vibratory senses that is the position and vibration sense up to the brain there may be the smaller diameter myelinated fibers and also unmyelinated smaller fibers which transmits the pain and temperature sensations and the autonomic fibers are usually the small diameter fibers so we have big diameter myelinated fibers which are the motor fibers big diameter unmyelinated fibers which are some of the sensory fibers carrying position and vibration sense small myelinated and unmyelinated fibers transmitting pain and temperature and autonomic unmyelinated smaller fibers so we have so many different types of fibers transmitting so many different types of senses either motor or sensory and accordingly as we said peripheral neuropathies may be a sensory it can be a motor it can be a neuro autonomic or it can occur singly or in combination types of the peripheral neuropathies they may affect the cell body in which case we call them a neuro neuronopathy or ganglionopathy if it is a myelin we call it a myelinopathy and if it affects the axon we call it a axonopathy and the different types of peripheral neuropathies have got different clinical and also electrophysiological properties of how fast and how much these deficiencies can be propagated so i think we will stop here for today in our next class we will try to finish up the neuropathies as well as one of its important component which is called the aidp or acute inflammatory demyelinating radiculoneuropathy or neuroradiculopathy so there can be two types one is the acute one is the chronic type of aidp and cidp which are basically inflammatory non infective somewhat autoimmune so these two components are also a part of peripheral neuropathy so we will try to describe and finish up the entire part in the next class and that will finish up your neurology thank you thank you sir